on the vault. High atop the pastoral center of the Diocese of Camden, you're listening to Talking Catholic. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Talking Catholic. I'm Jen Morrow, and with me today is Mike Walsh. Hi. With with great irritation, I have to comment that last week's podcast that neither of you nor I were on Mm -hmm. was outstanding. And if you haven't listened to that particular episode, I'm going to have to ask you to go back and listen to it. My preference would be to just turn it down whenever Mike Bress and Marinella <laughs> Nunez talk, Stop and then it. turn it back up again when uh, Dr. Sarah Kearns talks, because she was, I, I was, it's not often that I'm truly impressed by one of our podcasts and how good it is, but listening to that as, as, as I was producing it, getting ready to put it out, I was really taken aback by how great how well-spoken she was, how she weaved her faith into all of these very technical areas of of the field of education from a higher level. Mm -hmm. It it was genuinely impressive. And it was the first time someone else had recorded a podcast, one of our other hosts had recorded a podcast, that I lamented the fact that I wasn't on that podcast. Wow. Yeah. That's some serious kudos right there. It really is. And it's kudos to her. I mean, granted, Mike and and Marianella asked all the right questions, but she really blew me away. You want to tell the listeners who we're speaking about, like who who she is in the diocese? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, She's the new assistant superintendent for school affairs. Basically, she handles all the policy stuff that uh, the school's department assists our various educational institutions with mm-hmm. and uh, she comes with it from a great track record but I, I it was really like blown away by it so if you haven't had an opportunity to go back and listen to that episode please do so because mm-hmm. it's probably one it I've already decided I'm gonna put it into next year's uh, packet of of Catholic Media Association uh, award submissions wow. it's really that good it's only what third week of January and you, and you already got one of your submissions for yeah. next year but that's not good because that means I have to remember it for, for another 50 weeks I thought you were going to say it's not good because now we have to only go up from here <laughs> nah I, I can't promise that <laughs> But but, and you know my disdain for PhDs, and she's a PhD, and yet I was really blown away. It's like I had to like, it was it was the strangest thing. It was just great. So I was very happy. So if you haven't listened to it yet, go back and listen. Go back and listen to it. I found out one of our uh, principals, um, one of our high school principals, just got his EDD, and all I could my my first reaction was ah, my condolences. <laughs> you are so one sided with this stuff. <laughs> Um, so I have some like funny news to report. So, funny news? Yeah. Well, like great news. Okay. Like funny great news is um, about two weeks ago I was down in up up I was up in the Ocean County area, diocese of Trenton, mm-hmm. where um, in North Jersey, it, where my house is, and I was at the Bible study and a a woman across the table. <laughs> shout out to Joyce. Joyce is one of our listeners. So. Good morning, Joyce. Hope she's not. I hope she doesn't have a doctorate. <laughs> she might not. Joyce, be if you have a doctorate, we apologize. Well, I apologize. I don't apologize. Um, so we're sitting at the table, and and Joyce says she repeats something. She's like, I heard this on the radio on one of the the Catholic uh, uh, radio programs on domestic church media, and then she she quotes it. And I was like, wait, I said that. You were listening to Talking Catholic. <laughs> I was so excited. Like, I like jumped up and clapped, basically. And she's like, oh, that's you? I'm like, that's me. <laughs> and it was absolutely fantastic. So to Joyce, who may or may not le- be leaving church right now as you listen to this, shout out from Talking Catholic. And to our listeners um, who might have headphones on like I have right now, if that piercing sound just blew out your eardrums, I apologize for that. I'll try. <laughs> hopefully I'll fix it in post. <laughs> The, no, that was great. I got to tell you, you did you do something that I'm incapable of. You knew your own quote. Like as soon as oh, I say stuff, I forget what yeah. I've said. Uh, but I do rem- when you quoted that to me, I did remember it from the podcast, mm-hmm. and that was outstanding. Well, it wasn't my quote. That's why. Uh, that's the reason I remember it is because we were- you were the one that said it. But but it came from somebody else. Right, it came from somebody else, mm-hmm. and I he you know that person told me that quote like you know four years ago, and I still remember it. Mm-hmm. So. That is this. And to our listeners, you know, feel free to anytime you run across any of us out in the wild, 
by all means, come up and say hi. Uh, you don't have to tell us what a great job you're doing. You can actually go the other way and be critical, and we'll, we accept that as well. We do. But especially if you run into Mike, use the critical stuff on him and the cheery stuff for me. Yeah, I don't... I, <laughs> he feeds off of it. It's like his super power. It is. Plus, if you really want to mess with my head, tell me something I did wrong, and I'll, I'll, I'll fester over it for six months. That's true. <laughs> Keep you up at night. Um, well, but, well, that is, but that is very nice. What was your name again? Joyce. Joyce. Thank you very much, Joyce. That was very kind of you to, A, be a listener, and, and B, to let us know that something that was said on the podcast, you know, resonated with you. Yeah. So, I feel like we're going to, we, we have a lot of things to talk about today, and we have a lot of great things going on in the diocese. Well, wait, before we do that. Right. You know, you always do a little promo for the newspaper before we get started. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And this is our Catholic Schools Week newspaper when this comes out. Mm-hmm. And that edition is a labor of love. I say somewhat tongue in cheek because it is a hard thing to put together every year. It's one of our biggest editions. And as the person who doesn't necessarily put it together, but takes a look at it before it goes out the door, I got to tell you, you guys did a great job this year. Really knocked it out of the park. That was an outstanding edition of the paper. And even better still, the front cover, which had nothing to do with Catholic Schools Week. There's an inside cover that is specific to Catholic Schools Week, but the outside cover had to do with a recent event in South Jersey and is some of the prettiest photos uh, from one of our, it was from a Filipino event and the color and joy and I wish every mass looked something like that. Aww. Just, just, just a, just a, just a smacks you right in the face with the vibrancy of the Catholic Church. It made me very happy to see. Oh. So, well done. Well, thank you. Um, it was like you said, a labor of love and a lot of people involved, from reporters to Mike Press to <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, designers and advertisers. So, um, pick it up. It's forty-eight pages. Yeah. This 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 issue. Twenty-four of those are Catholic Schools Week dedicated, with all fresh content, new ideas, um, heard from some new people. And then uh, 20 pages of regular content, which is all local, except Mm -hmm. for about two pages of it. So if you want to know what's been going on in South Jersey, pick up the Catholic Star Herald this week. Yeah, no, that's a that's that is a proper local news publication. I'm very I'm very honored that I get to be a part of it, but very proud of you guys for putting putting it together so well. I even have to compliment the ads. The ads were outstanding this year. I only counted one bad one and I let everyone know which one it was (laughs) So because we got to improve on that next year. But the the ads. Ads were really, even the ads were great. So good job. Kudos to everybody on board. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And I won't say that to any of their faces. So I hope they listen to the podcast. I I will relate that. Okay. (laughs) Or tell them to fast forward to minute seven. Yeah, roughly. 35 yeah, of roughly. the podcast. There you go. How about that? <laughs> so um, mm, yes. I'm bringing the guest in early because we've already uh, attacked him, uh, sub, you know, silently. So I, I wasn't silent about it. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Michael Sims, the director of our diocesan office of life and justice. Hello. Good morning. Yes, I'm Mike Sims, and I have a doctorate. <laughs> Hi, Mike. <laughs> well, actually, it's a THD, so I don't know. That's the OG no, of doctorates, there you of, go. Uh, to be honest with you. <laughs> Thank you both for having cool. me on uh, this morning. No, we're Appreciate happy to have you. <clears throat> the, uh, no, no, actually, you are sort of the focal point for the next couple of weeks for us, as a matter of fact. You have a litany of projects coming down the pike, and so many that we really felt like we needed to have you on all by yourself. I not, appreciate that. Not allow you to be overshadowed by your colleagues in the pastoral department. Right. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to shine and really show off. <laughs> so we're, we're very excited about that. But you have genuinely a ton of stuff coming through the Diocese of Camden, and all of it is top-notch, and most of it... If not all of it, I've never seen anything similar to it. I think we have one redo of an event. Otherwise, it's all brand new stuff. So, well it, done. Yeah, and to be brutally honest to all this, many of this is uh, as, as this role of the director of Office of Life and Justice to be a conduit from people to people. I'm, I'm serving as that conduit to let things that might be running at Sacred Heart Parish or Christ Our Light and to support – uh, help sponsor, collaborate, and we may be talking about St. Maximilian Colby, those things that the diocese should need, needs to know and be involved in as we further build the kingdom of God. And there's some really good stuff coming dinner and a lot of great creative and imaginative and faith-filled people that are doing it. Yeah. So uh, before we start out with the diocesan office, because, uh, let's throw out a few 
local parish life and justice events that are going on, who you work with, all of these these mm-hmm. people. I think one of the first ones that we have um, coming up is a holo- the son of a Holocaust survivor will be speaking about how his mother help led an uprising at uh, a death camp in Poland, which that story, and the mother lived in, eventually they moved to Vineland. Right, correct. So right. Um, that's coming up. I believe, do you know? January 30th, yeah. Tuesday, January 30th, 7 p.m., Craystar Light, and Cherry Hill at the Paris Center. And so the guest speaker is Marvin Robb, who has one of the finest Holocaust uh, educators in our area. So he'll be speaking there, and that's open to all. And you can contact anyone there at Christ Our Light, and they will gladly help you. You don't no need for registration. It's an open, free event. Uh, um, International Holocaust Remembrance Day is this Saturday, January twenty seventh. This is why they are they are taking that time to do that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of days later, um, the Black Catholic uh, Ministry Commission will be having an award-winning and nationally known musician, Mr. Roger Holland, um, who specializes in Black Catholic liturgical music. He'll be uh, around on February 3rd, 7 p.m., uh, also at Christ Our Light in Cherry Hill. And then the following day, February 4th, he'll be playing music for Mass. Yeah, Christ Our Light is really hitting it out of the park with bringing in some really internationally known folks, uh, especially with regard to faith uh, and music. I mean, what galvanizes us best, you know, in those terms, you know, how we are alive in our faith and our prayer through music. Mm-hmm. That's a Please get out to see that. That is going to be um, a remarkable event. I actually have to give them a credit on a number of different fronts. They have outstanding, outstanding music ministry there too. So any, anytime you you go there, uh, it's it's a feast for the ears, mm-hmm. really, genuinely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm talking to you, Ted Baker. I, I saw your quarantunes recently, and it was outstanding. So, there, there you go. <laughs> uh, and then February 10th, uh, uh, Sacred Heart Church in Camden, uh, there will be some. Uh, I think four speakers, four guest speakers will be visiting to talk about um, the Bachman ins- Terrace, the you. 60th anniversary <laughs> Peace on Earth of <laughs> John, St. John the 23rd. Uh, Father Vince Guest is uh, piloting that group that it's part of the Peace and Justice Co- well, Coalition in this area. And um, Brother Michael McGrath, uh, artist extraordinaire, is uh, helping to also lead. He's one of the guest speakers in there. Um, along with Rabbi Arthur Owasco, who's the director of the Shalom Center. Um, and I, 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 so the Coalition for Peace uh, and Action, which is based out of Princeton, New Jersey, has met annually um, over the years. And this is their uh, annual event. And they're focusing on Pachman Terrace, the Peace on Earth. What a great time to kind of do think of that, lean into that, given our hostilities in our world. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, February 10th, 9 to 1.30. Um, that event actually is posted on the Life and Justice uh, website, um, which is camdiocese.org, backslash LJ, um, Life and Justice um, backslash. So you can find that, but the, I think there's a registration there that you can, we will upload on our Dotson website too. And you can also attend by Zoom if you can't get out Correct. to Correct. Thank so, you. Good stuff. All right. So one of the reasons that we have you on today is... Because not only are you a conduit, right. but sometimes you lead these things. Yes. As some might call an expert in your field. I, Some I don't know who. <laughs> I've heard people. I've heard people. Say I've heard it been said. Hopefully, it's the yes. folks on the pastoral floor. <laughs> so you're leading a pre Lenten mission of February first and eighth. That's correct. All right. So Two why don't you Thursday tell us about evenings it? of reflection, and you know, it's actually one of the dynamic uh, parishes uh, in terms of faith and zeal. Uh, Saint Maximilian Colby in Memora, New Jersey. Um, I've been meeting, and part of this role is to meet those parishes and those committees, life and justice specifically, but anyone that's doing social ministry outreach, and to see where we can collaborate, what's, see the need, meet the need, but also within the parish, how might this office support and collaborate with those fine people? And so, uh, two people in particular, Sister Connie Trainer, special associate there in life and justice coordinator, along with Joe Mitchell, uh, 
and Father uh, Peter Samaki. At one point, we sat down with him to see what might the parish need uh, in, in this time to focus their energies prior to Lent. So the idea was kicked around to have something kind of a pre-Lenten mission, although we weren't using the word mission, and to do not like a traditional three days, which is to do it in two days, because usually a third day people don't um, come. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's two days seems to be the hot time. But uh, in this vein, what we decided and uh, worked on was to talk about something of a very unique topic, why we do what we do as Catholics. So that's an interesting question, mm. isn't it? Because mm -hmm. there are many ministries there at uh, Maximilian Colby, and I actually have the lists of here. I mean, they. I mean, they have over kind of forty ministries in and of themselves. Um, many what of our parishes do. We want to highlight that. So it's an evening for those involved in ministries, those in the parish who may not be involved to become involved, and anyone else might be who wanted to know a little bit about that topic. So in kicking around this topic, which I think is very unique because it's not my own, it, it came out of particularly one person. I'll say his name on air, Joe Mitchell, um, who thought this is kind of. Uh, what he does at WHYY and kicking around marketing and the like, and what would draw some, some people in. So the first evening is to kind of really talk about, well, well what is it that makes us different in the world? How, how might we be counter-cultural? How would you distinguish someone who's a Christian from someone who's not? So we, I'm going to be leading uh, the first part on, well, what is those four pillars of our faith? And they're namely scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. So it's going to be a little humorous take on those things where we might see uh, within our scripture what calls us. It's not by faith alone, but also good works, leaning to things like Matthew 25, uh, corporal works of mercy, to talk about what are those things that are distinct about us as being Christians, particularly Catholics. Now, so that's the kind of feeding part, but there's also a witnessing to these two evenings. And the witnessing is Deacon Bill Slavin, who is the chair uh, of uh, Joseph's house in Camden. And he's also, of course, a deacon. And he's going to share his experience, his faith journey. Uh, and having met him at the diaconate convocation, we struck a court with each other and talking about of our experiences and I said you're the guy you're the guy to come to this uh, this evening of reflection so he's going to come and speak now what makes this uh, not a passive event there's going to be journaling and there's going to be opportunity for fellowship as any time you have a mission or any church gathering uh, fellowship good food good fun with folks around you um, this spills over into the second evening which we're going to talk about something that Bishop Barron spoke about it's a really neat idea. It's called the loop of grace. Is what you receive as gift in your life, you give as gift. And then it comes back to you as, as gift. So this is an evening, I'm going to speak to that. Like, what, what does grace mean in our life? And how do we look at the world differently through a different perspective as Catholics? This role of grace uh, in, our, in our lives, God's transformative action in the world. So I'll speak to that, but this is the unique thing about working with people like Joe Mitchell, Mitchell and, and Connie Trainer, Agnes Bross, who does religious education, and Florence Driscoll, who I'm giving a plug out, who goes and picks up, collects things, furniture, household goods to give to immigrants, and picked up by Jose Sanchez and Catholic Charities, as well as women in need who are battered. She delivers them, she makes sure she got them. These are the people that are in the trenches doing this. The gifts that they have give, they receive back tenfold in many of those relationships. So what we're gonna do in that second part is talk up do a little spiritual gifts inventory with the folks there. So the people, it may be a table conversation with various people who are ministries and the stories that were, were shared. And I will tell you, Mike and Jen, when I was at the meeting um, at the beginning of the month, cashing out the particulars, uh, the folks there who were sharing their experiences of working with Catholic Charities at Rio Grande in a very unique program of company, their stories are going to be shared that evening with the other parishioners. And they were all about journeying with an 18 year old who's a recent immigrant who doesn't have parents who just needs a job to then get connected and help and support the families who are coming uh who are here in our country who've been in our country families in need 
How might they, with Catholic Charities, get rent assistance? So they have all these stories and these encounters that they're going to share at table, and there'll be some table discussion, and following that, some more fellowship. So I'm really stoked, if I might say, about these two evenings of reflection. And how do you, I mean, they're called pre-Lenten um, reflection evenings. You said you don't want to use missions. I'm looking at the, the newspaper. It's got missions in the headline. Um, <laughs> That's quite all right. <laughs> uh, so like, ah, what's that? so uh, explain a little bit about how that leads us into Lent. Right. So Lent is that time for only deep reflection. And it was... Um, an oblate, uh, St. Francis de Sales, uh, confrere Brother Michael McGrath, who I lived with for a time, uh, the late uh, uh, Father Rick Wojcicki, who said, Lent, consider about taking up that which you hold to be your faith and journeying with others with that, like taking up the cross. So it's kind of recognizing that which I have as gift, that I've been given as gift in my life, how might I make that real in transforming and reconciling the world to Christ? That's the connection to Lent and I bring to the table, and how I might be fed in that way, so that I prepare for that. Well, we are a resurrected people of faith. That is, we are a resurrection faith, right? So that how might I live that faith in a way that brings, as this new sin out of joy and hope, hope is being the key, how might I bring hope to the world? Because there's hope. The cross is not about just the death. It's about the hope of the resurrection. So that's the connection. Hmm. Can you say that quote again? No, Sorry. probably not. <laughs> It was really good. I want to hear it again. And I was like, should I ask that question? Because maybe that might be mean. But <laughs> I think that was a spirit talking, oh, Jen. Okay, then I mean... I'll just rewind the podcast. Because it was really good. We do have it recorded. <laughs> oh, do we? <laughs> do we do. We're fine. It's totally recording right now. Or you can ask Joyce what he said. Uh, yeah, yeah. She'll know. The, but, well, I mean, you know, you and I, uh, Jen, I'd like to think have sort of an different appreciations for Catholicism and sort of what we focus on and what we draw from it. You know, oftentimes you and I are not necessarily in agreement on certain parts of how our faith is utilized. Uh, is this, here, listening to him talk, like I had my reaction to it. Mm -hmm. Is that what feeds you? Is this the kind of stuff that feeds you? Because you, you've, I've always found we're, you know, social justice-y. <laughs> As you, that, that, as you were listening that, that's to him, a, I was actually no comment. with a Y at the end of that, in case you were wondering. <laughs> I was actually um, looking to, to you to see if you were nodding your head. Oh, well, yes. This is one of the this is one of the aspects of our faith that feeds me. You are correct on that. Um, I, you know, it's interesting because anybody who's who's you know, listen to me on the podcast. I'm a big fan of Bishop Barron. Mm -hmm. And um, right. I was curious what the lo loop of grace, like I've, he I've heard him talk about grace, um, yeah. but I didn't, wasn't <clears throat> familiar with the loop of grace. So that's definitely something. I mean, I already knew when I read this that I wanted to attend. Um, I knew when I read this that you wanted to attend. There you go. <laughs> but uh, for two reasons. Um, first off, you know, who's speaking? Mm -hmm. Mr. Sims, I, this is your, your, your Ballywick. And, and, yeah. and I'm, you know, looking forward to, to deacon speak as well but i mean who doesn't want to know why we do what we do as catholics or yeah. you know what i mean and even if we all think we know it's good to hear go hear, hear somebody else and maybe put a little bit of information in there that we weren't thinking about before right and I, I think that's a pretty astute because it is the do it's the doing right, right. and that is um we, you know we don't sometimes i think we might get caught up in the contemporary culture of saying social justice, which it is that. But we have to look through the lens of our Catholic faith, not see it just as social justice, but works of mercy. Right. That's kind of where, that's the lean into this, these two evenings, is to see that your works, you're bringing mercy to others. And, you know, this kind of ties back into something that... Uh, God's when, mercy. When Father Jason Rocks was on our podcast the other day, we were speaking about the Synod, and, and how the word justice is mentioned all the time to the fact that maybe no, this is not him saying that this is me saying it, maybe it it it's thrown around so much social justice social justice that people are starting to to glaze over it right like i hope not but i'm sure that that's out there but when you put it like this the doing and that that's part of what we're what our faith is i and then that to, to me that ties into lent right, right because right. what do we think about with lent all right we're always giving things up but what if we were picking something up and Amen. doing right. something during That's exactly our Lent right. instead of just 
um, you know, we always say giving up chocolate or whatever. Yeah. I'm not giving up chocolate. But, <laughs> you know. I don't think you should, actually. You, but what can we do? <laughs> what can we pick up? Just right. as Jesus picked up the cross, what can right. we pick up to do for others during Lent? So I, I think this is an interesting... You're spot on, I believe. And that's where the folks there at St. Maximilian Colby were looking to kind of... Those in ministry and those from the Life and Justice um, team were looking to do. Now, they are one of many ministries, but they're helping to kind of bring their other ministries on board to this conversation. So they're taking the lead on that. And uh, I'm very excited about that. And never forget that justice, what love looks like in action. Mm -hmm. That is a nice thumbnail definition. And, you know, I had a conversation recently with somebody. Uh, I was talking about the corporal works mercy. of mercy. I did say that right, right? You did. Okay, because I, I think the other day on the podcast, I called it the corporate works of mercy. <laughs> hey, listen, it's good so, to get big business in here doing mercy as well. That's fine. Corporal works <laughs> yeah. of mercy, which, again, is a picking up. Mm-hmm. Right, so sometimes you, know, you should do a whole series of the corporal works of Murphy. Like you take a different one and you you like leading put a story up to Lent. With it. Wasn't that a great idea? Leading um, up to Lent, thinking that's when, you're being that's a great would idea. Do you think that that is appropriate for Lent? Like yes. everybody considering the corporal Absolutely. works of mercy during right. Lent. If you think of where they come from, and that's Matthew 25, and you go on the verse that's 30 something. I'm sorry, 33, mm-hmm. uh, which is the judgment of the nations, and that's when Jesus separates the sheep and the goat. And, uh, you know, the, 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 those who are the sheep, you know, um, come and inherit the kingdom of them that have been paired for you. For I was hungry and you gave me something to drink. And, um, I was committed to eat and thirsty and you gave me something to drink, as you all might know that. And they say, of course, when, when did we do that? Whatever you've done to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did to me. Mm-hmm. That's the judgment of nations. And we could just take a step back for a moment and kind of sink into that and then do something that you're suggesting. I think that would be very appropriate. So, okay, here's another question, right? Here's, I, I think also when we think about the corporate works of mercy. I'm all right, I'm laughing. Did you say it again? Oh, I did say it that time. That's when we did say it. Jeez. That's because somebody's staring at me intently out of the corner of my eye. You're, you're speaking. What, what, what? All right. Corporal works in Corporal works. It was almost like you were waiting for me to say it. Well, I should have known better, but yes. Corporal works of mercy. Let's just take, for example, feeding the hungry. Yes. Okay. I would also make the argument that a parent feeding their children, that that you know, somebody who is home all day with their children or somebody who is working all day and comes home to put food on their table with their children. I would consider that that counts. And if you're talking about in spirituality, hey, I would I would, do, would too. Um, everyday spirituality or everyday mysticism, let's say someone like Thomas mm-hmm. Merton or others and Carl Rahner would say that those every those small acts done with great love, right? Mm-hmm. St. Teresa, uh, would be works of mercy in terms, of, especially what you're feeding your children too, you know? The things that give them <laughs> true nourishment. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking immediate. For some reason, immediately what popped into my head is dinosaur chicken nuggets. They are good. I know. And, and they're adorable. <laughs> I, I, but I, I said that counts. It doesn't count. I'm, put, I'm using air quotes. I'm oh, not like I, God's I, up there I, like I, keeping you know, a tally. So. <laughs> like, yeah, all right, that counts. Well, um, as a parent, I would say we're all parents here at this table. We know that that is probably one of the best things that we could do for our children is provide not only nourishment, but that what we call table fellowship, some time to sit down as a family and, and eat. Mm-hmm. Right? I mm-hmm. think that does count, you know? And that's big in our household, especially since we have not only my children, my oldest who lives with me, but our mother-in-law. So that's important. Mm-hmm. You know, when Din Din comes around. So. I actually says Sorry. going going up, how we feed our parents, particularly in their later yeah. years, how we care for them, how we take them in, things like that. Mm-hmm. Some might call that a corporal work of mercy. Oh, corporal. Absolutely. <laughs> However, if you if you put them in a nursing home, then it's a corporate work of mercy. Wait, what if? What if okay. my fault? He at colleague, least nodded. You didn't even. You just went right. Yeah, past went right him. over it. What if my colleague, le- you know, lets me have a granola bar? Or is that is that a corporate work of mercy if I'm hungry and that person feeds me? Well, it depends on who it is and whether they've laced it with something. But <laughs> I, I don't. I don't really know. What do you think about I this? I don't shit? ask my colleagues for food for just that reason. <laughs> I don't know who's out to get me. I have a I have a different question though, because okay. you mentioned something during your your explanation that I simply don't understand. 
and this could finally be I've reached a, a, an age where there are now words that I, I can't comprehend and how they're being used nowadays mm. so and I, I ask this because my, my phone is now haranguing me about this you mentioned journaling all right now I never kept a diary I prefer not to write with my hand to begin with I'm more of a thumbs and keypad kind of guy now so what is journaling why do we do it and is there any way I could be convinced into actually doing it not related to this that's sort of a that's sort of a one off at the end you would agree that with me that you're a thinking man I prefer to think of myself as a ranting man but okay <laughs> Journaling is simply your reflective thoughts, your thoughts and reflection put on paper. So it is that unedited uh, in response to something, whether it's a, a question or an experience, that you want to further see how that might affect you personally. Jen, what's journaling? That didn't help. <laughs> really? No, I okay. don't know. I, I can give I, another stab I, at it. Okay, good, try, try again. So uh, let me rephrase it. Let me, actually, I, I, how are you going to utilize journaling in in your not a mission? Well, there's going to be a question or two to then feed a response, to have a response, to take a moment for reflection, and then share that reflection with others, what, what their thoughts are, unedited, you know, uh, to with others. And that's how we're going to uh, use that in that evening. And so it's a time for conversation, because sometimes um, we are, all three of this, I think, at this table are, are easy in conversing with one another and other people that oh, I could think about it and say it, but other people need to, and this is my years as an educator, might need to write it down and then been prompted to be able to share what they're doing. So they're engaged in it and they're not passive. So I might want to say that journal is a way to be to make my thinking not so passive but active. And then I see what I am thinking, writing it down. Uh, and, and on paper, literally, so that I might just come down and say, oh, I really did think that. And that is where I can see this trajectory of thought going. As, as, as I look at Jen nodding her head, have you journaled? This time I am nodding. I've journaled since I was in kindergarten, maybe even before that. Like I have yeah. I, my, my first diary, I was in kindergarten in Denver uh, when I lived in Denver, and so that's where I remember sitting at my mom's kitchen table writing in that, and I've right. written all the way up to my adulthood. Yeah, if I might, that's amazing. If I might say, most of the writing, most of the writings of Saint Augustine of Hippo were basically his journaling. Mm -hmm. That's what we have. His, his, they became, and that can be many other saints uh, too as well. And they were his response to these experiences and his faith that he's tracking and journaling of writing. Well, the reason I, I made a little side dig in there was how my phone is now yelling me about this. Um, for, for those of you who have an iPhone, uh, you just had a new app. Last time you installed uh, the newest operating system, you had an app put on your phone called a journal app. Oh, really? Yes. I noticed that. Yes. I wonder where that came from. Well, that, Apple has decided that uh, we should all be reflective like this and gave us an app to do that. And you can do it either by typing it in or you can use their voice recognition and talk into it. I haven't utilized it yet, mostly because I can't. I, I couldn't fathom a reason why I needed to use it. Now, maybe it's because, to your point, you know, there are people who who are not like I'm pretty introspective. I'm constantly thinking about the world. I've never felt the need to write it down, mostly because you know I don't want it used against me in a court of law. But the you know I just never really felt <laughs> inclined to do it. But I think about these things all the time. So I was curious now that I've seen now that Apple has told me that this is apparently a thing. I was curious as to like what its value is. But yeah. it sounds like to certain people it would be very valuable. Well, I'll tell you what I get out of it. First off, I'm also a very introspective person. I think a lot of people are. But at the end of the day, and the next day when you wake up. I mean, you'll remember kind of what you were thinking about, but you're not going to remember every little detail. Mm -hmm. When you write it out, first off, I don't know about you, Mr. Sims, but when I write, it seems that there's a different connection between my writing, and I and I actually do write it out with a pen and pen paper. I don't type it yeah. because I find that it's a different kind of connection. Absolutely. It's almost, and then sometimes I, what I've written, I didn't even know I was thinking. It's like it doesn't cam come from the brain. It comes from the heart. And then That's you right. read it, and you're like, I wrote that. And the reason I write it out is because when you type, you tend to delete. Correct. Versus when you're writing with a you, pen or pencil, you just mark it out. Correct. And then you go back, and you're like, well, and I actually did think that. 
sometimes part of the the I don't say trick, but the the nuance that's key in journaling, especially with pen and paper, is that you're not editing those thoughts. So so we might say, oh, I don't want to say that because oh, the, but that's the persona that I have out there, and not all the people would think badly for that. Something you'd be honest with yourself. So journaling has to be honest mm-hmm. in that in that vein. Um, to, and when you're typing, you're actually that's you're in a you're using a a, a medium that is for well, quote unquote, perfection. You're trying to type right. to, to make sure it's clear, it's understandable to others. Sometimes you just need to be understandable to yourself and honest with yourself. And don't get me wrong, there are large gaps in my writing because I, I, I couldn't be honest with myself. I mean, I couldn't pick up a journal. Wow. And that yeah, is a huge... Um, and then you journal tell. on that. I could not pick up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, when you see <laughs> like there's like an eight-year gap and then... Or, no, actually, it was a three-year gap and then you realize you know what happened then right and then you know because you think back and you're like okay that's what was going on i couldn't write about it but that is telling in itself i think when you know if you're a journal person and then you can't pick up or even if you're not but you don't want to pick up a journal and a pen or paper because you're afraid of what's going to come out that's a telling sign in itself yes i would agree yeah i do I journal about once a month, at least, minimally, you know, try to write some thoughts that are going on. And now I have a work journal saying, more or less, it's more about who I've met and those encounters, but they're they're helpful in saying, oh, I've made these connections. Uh-oh, we're in trouble, Mike. <laughs> Mike? Sims has got a whole <laughs> journal about us. <laughs> to his point, it's better not to put things on paper. <laughs> I mean, I think everybody worries about that. Let's be honest, everybody worries about that. They're like, oh, I don't want journal. to die, and then yeah. somebody finds all this out. Yeah. Now we're back to Mean Girls. Right. <laughs> First off, if it's I have thrown them out or burned them in the fireplace because sometimes I just want it for me to see, and then I'm like, all right, I got it out, it's got to go, right? And that's fine too. But you know, going also back to mm-hmm. what's the purpose of it, mm-hmm. I it's hard to go back and read the journals sometimes, but sometimes I'll just even pick it up and read it from when I was writing in my teenage years, and to see what I was thinking about then, mm-hmm. besides boys and new kids on the block. <laughs> um, I realize how far I've come when it comes to personal challenges and flaws. When I, I'll read it and I'm like, wow, I was a really, well, I'll just say angry person then. I'm not angry anymore. It's really cool to see how you can overcome that. No, it's, I say that all the time, how I'm not angry Thanks anymore. Thanks for sharing it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Actually, kill me. The, well, okay, I was, there was throwing a, eye daggers at Mike. <laughs> there, was, there was one other thing that uh, I wanted to go back to because we kind of glossed over a little bit. Your, your, your fellow presenter is, um, is Deacon Bill Slater. Deacon, Deacon Bill Slater. And That's we mentioned the, uh, Joseph House, but we didn't, we didn't say what Joseph House was. So Joseph House is a homeless shelter in, uh, in Camden. Thank you. Does great work. Truly uh, wonderful work there, and uh, very much um, you know, sort of the in the in the vein of um, Pope Francis's uh, call that you know we have to have the uh, smell of the sheep on us. Uh, oh yeah, you know, agreed. Out there, and he you know he really does have an, an impressive, and actually everybody that works there are just just absolutely wonderful people, and you know it's I think so, I think. I think in today's day and age, you know, I worked in homeless shelters for a long, not in homeless shelters, I worked with homeless shelters for a long time in another job. And, you know, I talked about them all the time and I sort of, you know, people kind of glaze over because, yeah, homelessness has been something that's, we've, have sort of gotten sort of gotten so used to that it's something that sits in the back of our heads, you know, and it's it's the kind of thing that oh we know that there are services available and oh sure you know the state will take care of this and you know the the cops will round up the people on the, the or move along the people on the street corners or on who are sleeping you know where we work in the diocese you know oftentimes our buildings are used by homeless folks to sleep on and the. In the dead of winter and the the heat of mm. summer, you know, they're, they'll they'll be there. So it's something we see. So maybe that's a reason why you know sometimes you can become kind of jaded to it. But I think it's a good thing for people who don't see that on a regular basis um, to be reminded of that that need exists. You know, and what I tell people, people will always think that homelessness is a is a situation related simply to the urban area. 
there are some beautiful homeless shelters that are in some of the prettiest forested areas in southern New Jersey. Uh, That's correct. Yeah. From that are housing people from those areas. You know, are you do not know what is going on in the houses around you. You don't know which wife has just been battered and tossed out of her house and needs some place to stay because uh, we don't see those things. You know, we, we this the culture that we live in currently is a lot more isolated than it's ever been before. We all, we all stay in our solo silos. We all stay in our areas. We don't, I, in this department, Jen, the rest of our staff, you know, it's yourself, you know, we have to go out and see everybody. We hear these stories all the time, but you know, I see the members of my extended family and realize man, they don't see what I see on a daily basis. You know, they see, what happens in their house, maybe their neighborhood and whatever they drive to and then drive back, yeah. you know, this commuter lifestyle, we just, we don't engage as much. And it's important to hear stories from people who are on the ground, you know, yeah. making a difference. Amen. And uh, so I, I was, I was very pleased that, um, not that you couldn't uh, do that all on your own, but it's mm -hmm. nice that uh, you're going to have somebody there with real world experience. Yeah, I, I'm very excited about that. And I feel like what you said, I thank you for sharing that is, is very uh, true to, and as well as the experience of those at Maxime and Colby who are, have now taken that step to actually and company those uh, people in need uh, and working with Catholic Charities and Rio Grande. So there's a contingent of them who are, are experiencing, who are going to share their stories to bring other parishioners and maybe some out of the parish who might be attending those evenings to say, this is my experience. Yeah. And this is how I've been transformed by it and, I, and, and the like. And please come, come along. Yeah. Some of the questions that will be journaled upon are there questions that will be journaled upon at the pre-Lenten um, There will be a session? couple. There will be a few. Are, be... are they related to what people, what they're going to hear? or are... So there will be time to react upon what you heard, what mm -hmm. resonated with you is one of the nice words I like to use. Okay. There will be a kind of uh, what we call generative questions. Mm -hmm. where, I mean, where do you see Christ and others type question on that? Well, I was journal. thinking about that because of what Mike was saying. Like if... Yes. if, 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 the, if you know, from the commuter who's door to door, right? Well, some of what they hear have them reflecting on that, per se. Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah, where do you see Christ in others is, is, a, is a kind of one of the questions that uh, goes to what Mike was just sharing. Like, what, what's your experience of seeing Christ? And well, I mean, hopefully your families and maybe those of your, who you fellowship in your parish, but what about seeing Christ in the poor? I think this is what our current pontiff has, uh, and others in the past have echoed, uh, the necessity for Christians uh, and Catholics to embrace the poor. I go back to something that you shared, I, it's, it, and it's one of my favorite quotes that I always do with St. Vincent de Paul, Father of the Poor. You know, it's not enough to give soup and bread, this the rich can do. It's only for your love alone that the poor will forgive you the bread that you give them. And so you have to then put you have to be in that position to be able to receive that love and you can't do it just by commuting from your home to whatever else right you have to engage right. and that's and that's imperative that's the point of the gospel imperative i think i don't i think that's where well, that's why matthew 25 is so important did you do these things hello uh, <laughs> and you know as someone who goes out of his way not to engage with anybody uh, ever at all including his colleagues you know, it's it's a struggle for me, but I, I'll tell you that every time I've ever done it, it has been uh, life changing. Um, and you know, when I'm forced to do it, even even in small matters, not necessarily going to a homeless shelter or going to a prison or something like that. At any time I've had the opportunity, you know, it's it makes a difference. And I don't mean that in a I don't mean that in a oh I feel better about myself now that I've done something. I mean that in a I understand better. Right. You know, the the time I spent working for Volunteers of America as we were running oh no, I'll say it. I, I love saying I love saying that name. Volunteers of America as uh all the Catholic charities people will always throw their eyes at me. But when I my time in Volunteers of America, I worked with a lot of halfway houses, I worked in a lot of homeless shelters, and I worked with a lot of battered women and I liked, right. I worked with a lot of batterers. Um, and it was, it was, it completely changed my life, uh, in, in that, in that I have a much, I feel I have a much better understanding of how the world works 
not just in urban areas, but in suburban and rural areas as well. And that, you know, the lifestyles that we are all currently used to in our in our quiet, comfortable silos is not the lifestyle that a great many people live in, whether that's Appalachia or whether yeah. that is Salem City, uh, New Jersey, or whether that's Mormora. Or, you know, it's, it's a different lifestyle once you get out of it. It's, it really is important to be aware of it, you know, and if you can't be aware of it, it's important to, you know, find opportunities where you can get some level of awareness. I'm not telling you, I, I'm not telling anyone that they need to go into downtown Camden or or the port area of Camden and start ministering to people. It's great if you want to do that. I would tell you that you should do it with an organization who has some wisdom in, in dealing with these unique populations. I wouldn't just go in there yourself. But it is a uh, it will it will alter your perspective on life as you know it, and I'm not I'm not saying that that's going to turn you into a Democrat or turn you into a Republican or or, or do anything from a political standpoint. It's just going to open your eyes to another way of life, and that you know the people who are living those lives, you know, they have a unique experiences, which is why they act the way they act, or they do the things that they do, or their interest levels are in the interest levels. I, I've told this story on the podcast before, and I've mentioned it, and my my wife has brought it up from time to time. You know, she, she had difficulty understanding. We were at a homeless shelter at a dinner. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were eating with the clients, and um, we were hearing their stories, and the stories were great. And my wife, this is very early on in my time uh, at Volunteers of America, and after my wife and I left, you know, she was like she couldn't understand why this woman was there because <laughs> she had really nice clothes on, and but she had these giant gold hoop earrings and giant gold necklaces, and mm-hmm. she was, you know, it was like, well, if you just sold that stuff, you wouldn't be homeless anymore. And I was like, well, that's that's there's sense to that, but you have to understand that you came from a population that uh, taught you these things. Other people have come from populations that didn't teach them things. Things that we sort of take for granted are not, and and their val- and a person's value systems might be skewed because of what they learned and what they didn't learn. But at the same time, they're going to have perspectives on things that they're going to think we're crazy. So, you know, you really got to have these conversations. And that was an eye-opening experience for her. Yeah. You know, and she was, and the woman that she was referring to is someone I had met before. Wonderful person, salt of the earth. Um, but because, you know, we only looked at her from sort of a, mm-hmm. you know, right. from a from a face value, and then go below that, you would make assumptions. That's right. You know. And yeah, so I have no idea if that that might be the only nice thing they own. They True. Could be wearing True. that every day. When we did the podcast um, last summer, or last spring at Catholic Charities, and we had the um, that father and uh, that was on that was a refugee from Ukraine, mm, and yeah, he right. had talked about you know, they had to leave Ukraine and yeah. you know, what do you bring with you, right? You're right. basically just bringing what's on your back. He wanted to bring a suit, you know, because he was a businessman. And even yeah. though he probably wouldn't be doing that here, yeah. that's, that's what, what he wanted had. to bring because right. that, it, you know, it, that had meaning to him. It's respect, it's dignity. Right. Um, no, and, you know, all uh, work is dignity, but that was, he wanted to keep that with him and yeah. remind himself of that. And it's, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's you gotta you know I I know it's sort of tired and sometimes people get tired of hearing it, but you know you really do have to walk a mile in another right. person's shoe. There's no there's no other way around it. So it's good that these opportunities exist and there are these ministries that are literally out there trying to to do this kind of work and open these kinds of eyes. And I'm not saying everybody's eyes are going to be open to it, but uh, as someone who you know we talk I joke on this podcast all the time about being jaded, not caring, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, no, I've been touched by this. These things they've they've altered my perspective on things, and and I have an appreciation for them. I mean, sure. it's funny, you know, listening to the two of you talk. You know, I, I I suspect that there are some listeners that are listening to this going, yeah, duh. That's you know, that's what we're supposed <laughs> to be doing. Why do we need to have a mission on this or whatever we're going to refer to it as? Uh, it's, I read the Bible. I know what I'm supposed to do. Uh, God bless you for for knowing those things, but uh, sadly, not not all of our Catholic brothers and sisters are as attuned as as you and I are. Right. So right. that's why these things exist. So if I might just say, you you brought up something, I, and say the more you talk with folks, you get to know them. Um, there's a profound thing, and this could be something for another article conversation for sure. We have to recognize that there are social, political, and economic. Uh, 
realities that uh, our gospel can, can butt heads with. Mm. And to be able to, for instance, on the economic end, if you think we fund our priorities, what are our priorities in our families? You know, education for our children. Well, how might that relate to our brothers and sisters in need? You know, so if you take a step back and an opportunity to see how other people might be doing that, that might lead you into real ways to um, affect some change, you know, in, in a way that's uh, transformative for others. And it might come from your purse, may come from your talent, and, uh, and of course, um, that those are two things that we often talk about. So um, that's great. Having that experience of Volunteers in America, that was similar to my experience that my wife and I had when we were in the Vincentian Service Corps. And we realized to see, take it out of their own little sheltered bubble of the reality of, of those uh, families in need, education being one of them, affordable housing, all came to, for a couple of years, there to the forefront of our minds. So it stays with us. And then we move in ways that our lifestyle reflects in ways how might we help uh, affect that change for others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you like to meet the CEO of Volunteers of America, John? He's a great guy. Dan Lombardo, yeah. awesome guy. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, you know, I before we get too far along, I, 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 so there's a lot of things coming up in February, but mm -hmm. you actually have two two events coming up in March. One just for diocesan personnel, but then another one that's for the public, and I wanted to hit on that as well. Uh, March 15th and March 16th. March 15th is our diocesan Lenten Day of Reflection. That's, That's just right. for us di diocesan folks. But then you are having a Step Up Dad the Day. Step Up Day for Dads. Step Up right. Day for Dads. It's a day of spirituality. And we need to talk about our women's spirituality. That's something Donna Octaviano, Britt, and I are talking about. But this is a day uh, held at Divine Mercy Parish, uh, 8.30 uh, to 2.30, 2 o'clock or thereabouts, um, where Mark Bircham, who's the founder of Net Ministries, uh, that works with parishes and building young adult ministry, he, along with his cohort, uh, Manny, Manuel Huerta, are going to come to uh, Divine Mercy Parishes, Divine uh, Divine Mercy being there in Vineland, and spend a day in a retreat and in, in conversation. He wrote a book. It's based upon the day. It's based upon his book, Step Up, uh, Dad, Your Kids Need You. And it's for fathers of all ages, single dads, maybe because of divorced or maybe their spouse died, uh, grandfathers, as well as spiritual dads, you know, who might be part of this day. And... Um, I met, and it's a bilingual event. So Andreas Arango and I, uh, uh, evangel Hispanic Ministry and Evangelization of the Parish, are working. We met with Mark and Manny last weekend. I'm very, uh, again, stoked about this day um, because in speaking about the three keynotes that are in the day for all men to think about in our, in our culture that often typifies or maybe makes men almost absent or dumbed down to the reality of their being a father, being a faithful spouse, and all those ways. He's The three keynotes are focused on, on this. I'll, I'll be very brief, but the first one is basically out of his book. It's that your kids need you. you have, okay, No matter whatever situation in life you might be, whether you're at home, you're married, spouse, under the same roof with all your children or not, your kids need you. And then he started to tell the story of that. And he has remarkable stories that he, he's sharing of his experience that led to him, not only his ministry, but being a better father. Um, and Mike, he can relate to this as, as well as Jen, because he's going to bring in a daughter component to all this, too. Mm. Um, that our dad's opinions of us over time carry great weight. And they often, for men, awaken a desire for those who have positive experience to be a dad. So he begins right there, and he starts to tell the story of being on uh, was Lake Superior, I believe, and they're skipping a, a stone with his son when he's very young. And then 18 years later, looks back at this older child, and they see that they had the same mannerisms in there and how cool and unique that was. Um, this is a day, by the way, too, uh, Mike, there's going to be journaling and small group oh, discussion. <laughs> I've already done that journaling part of mine. That, as, as aforementioned, all of my teenage years. So I'm good. Very really good. Um, I hope that you're able to come to this, Jen. Actually, I hope you're able to come to it too. Jen. I, I just because um, I, I know I really do. The, the, the second keynote are going to be Dad's most valuable resources. And what do you think they might be? And when we talk about this, this is from his book, Time and Words. Mm. This idea of presence and. Um, uh, but the one thing they was doing, and I was actually getting very emotional during, during this this uh, Zoom call, uh, and Andre, Andre started talking his, about his experience with his two daughters too, was that um, you got to. You know, it's really there 
in your own backyard. You invite your kids into things that you enjoy. And that's a great way to make connections. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, my father was hunting, which I did that for a while. Then after shooting a deer and then having to field dress it, I didn't like that anymore. But I still went out with my dad. Just, you, you just aim a little to the left every single time. Sure, I get to it. To do that, because it meant a lot. And then I found out with that, my father was a great lover of nature and conservatoriness. Mm. So, so it was all those type of things. Uh, and that to, to strive to give your kids great memories, uh, not just memorabilia. That's one of his things. Mm. I love that. Yeah, I started to nice. really, because um, I, I grew up, my mother was uh, single. My mom and dad separated when I was very young. But my mother was still, father was still in my life. And he strove for the time that he had with me to do that. I was reflecting on that. And, of course, traditions are very key and a transmission of value. So he's going to speak to that. But the well, thing – Unfortunately, we, we do have to, we okay, have to wrap, wrap it up. So Okay, we'll, but so those are the type of things come to that day. Oh, we're yeah. going to have you back. We're going to have – we have to get back on and talk about that. Yeah, we'll see. So uh, that'll be uh, March 16th, and there'll be more advertising about that coming out soon. So if you want to come to it, we hope you will. But, Mike, thank you very much thank for uh, joining us today. We really You're appreciate that. Jen, Jen, thank you for being here. And to our listeners, thank you as well. We'll catch you all next week. See you, everybody.